Dear students, welcome to this class of Principles of Macroeconomics. I am your teacher, Muhammad Nadeem Sarwar. Today, we shall discuss some historical events through ISLM framework. We shall first discuss the US recession of 2001 and then the global financial crisis of 2008. We shall discuss what events led to these crises and what was the policy reaction to these crises. We shall explain all this through ISLM framework. So let's start with the lecture. Dear students, in 2001, the US economy experienced a pronounced slowdown in economic activity. The unemployment rate that was at 3.9% in September 2000 rose to 4.9% in August 2001 and then further increased to 6.3% in June 2003. In many ways, the slowdown looked like a typical recession driven by a fall in aggregate demand. There are three notable shocks that explain this event. First of them was a decline in stock market. During 1990s, the stock market experienced a boom of historical proportions as investors became optimistic about the prospects of new information technology. Some economists viewed the optimism as excessive at the time, and unfortunately this proved to be the case. When the optimism faded, the average stock prices fell by about 25% from August 2000 to August 2001. The fall in market reduced households wealth and thus consumer spendings. In addition, the declining perception of the profitability of new technologies led to a fall in investment spendings. Both of these resulted a leftward shift of IS curve. The second shock was terrorist attack on Twin Towers on September 11, 2001. In the week after the attacks, the stock market fell another 12%, which at the time was the biggest weekly loss since Great Depression of 1930s. Moreover, the attacks increased uncertainty about the future world. This uncertainty reduced spendings because households and firms postponed some of their plans until the uncertainty is resolved. These events also resulted in leftward shift of IS curve. The third shock was a series of accounting scandals at some of the nation's most prominent corporations, including WordCom. The result of these scandals was the bankruptcy of some companies that had fraudulently represented themselves as more profitable than they truly were. Criminal convictions for the executives who had been responsible for the fraud started and new laws aimed at regulating corporation accounting standards more thoroughly were introduced. These events further depressed stock prices and discouraged business investments. 
These also resulted in shifting IS curve to the left. Together these factors resulted in significant drop in GDP. In response to these shocks, authorities responded with supportive measures. First, Congress passed a tax cut in 2001 including an immediate tax rebate and a second major tax cut in 2003. These tax cuts increased take home or disposable income of the households and thus resulted in increasing consumer spending. This pushed IS curve to right. In addition, after terrorist attack, Congress increased government spendings by appropriating funds to assist the New York's recovery and to bail out the ailing airline industry. This increase in government spendings also caused IS curve to shift to right. To support GDP increase and avoid crowding out, the Federal Reserve pursued expansionary monetary policy. It reduced policy rate significantly which resulted in increasing money supply. Because of this action, LM curve shifted downward, which did not let interest rate to increase despite an increase in consumer spending and expansionary fiscal policy. Together, these policy actions helped overcome the recession. Now, we see all this with the help of diagrams. First, let's study the impact of decrease in stock prices, increase in uncertainty due to 9-11 and accounting scandals on economy through ISLM framework. We assume that economy is in equilibrium at even where both IS and LM curves intersect. This intersection determines the level of income and interest rate in the economy. Now, because of decrease in household wealth, because of stock price fall, increase in uncertainty because of 9-11 and accounting scandals, consumers cut their spendings and firms cut their investments. Therefore, IS curve shifted to left. This resulted in reducing the level of income in the economy. Now we study the policy response. We assume that first there was a tax cut and bailout package for airline industry. These actions pushed IS curve to right. Meanwhile, the Fed pursued with expansionary monetary policy actions, which resulted in shifting LM curve down. Therefore, the level of income increased and thus economy recovered from recession. Now, the recession of 2008. Students, because of earlier recessions, the Fed was pursuing with low interest rate policy, reduced cost of borrowing, lower mortgage rates, and this allowed more home buyers to qualify for mortgage and allowed them to buy bigger homes. This stimulated new home construction which is a part of real GDP. Housing prices surged and many new units were bought not only as residences but also as 
speculative investments. Fed's low interest rate policy also allowed many home owners to refinance their mortgage by repaying the old loan with a new loan usually involving an increase in the amount borrowed. When the interest rates stabilized in 2003, refinancing continued due to rise in house prices. Since the higher price of a house let homeowners to borrow more against it. Alongside this, a subprime mortgage sector also developed in which low-income households were enticed into taking loans that required minimal down payments and virtually no verification of employment or income. However, this also resulted in housing bubble as the prices of houses rose more faster than that could be justified by the fundamentals like household income or the amount of the rent charged for an apartment. The essence of a bubble is that eventually the merry-go-round has to end because housing prices cannot rise forever relative to household income. This began to slow down when the Fed raised federal fund rates in stages from 1% in mid-2004 to 5.25% in mid-2006. This increased the rate on housing loans too. That resulted in decreasing the demand for the houses. Moreover, the increase in the rate made it unaffordable for subprime borrowers to pay their installment. They defaulted and their houses were auctioned which increased housing supply and therefore the prices of the houses dropped. Once house prices were falling, many households suddenly found that they were in trouble and began to cut back sharply their consumption spending. Speculators who had brought houses in order to flip them at higher prices found themselves instead stuck with houses worth less than mortgage debt borrowed against them. With the passage of time, the decline in house prices became steeper and many homeowners found that they could not keep up with their monthly mortgage payments. Therefore, they surrendered their houses to financial institutions who issued loan against them. However, when these houses were auctioned, their prices were so low because of higher supply that financial institutions were unable to make full recovery of their loan. Therefore, financial market started collapsing and stock prices also started to drop further. This further increased household wealth and fueled the global financial crisis of 2008. Now we see the policy responses. First, the Federal Reserve cuts its target for federal fund rate from 5.25% in September 2007 to about zero in December 2008. Moreover, Congress allocated $700 billion to rescue the financial system. A large part of these funds were used for equity injections into banks and the US government became a part owner of these banks for temporary period. One of the very first acts of newly elected president, Mr. Barack Obama, was his health support program, 
which aim to support a major increase in government spending to expand the aggregate demand. Moreover, Federal Reserve also encouraged borrowing and private spending through various unconventional monetary policy measures. We leave the ISLM treatment of the recession to you and hope you will be able to do that easily. That's all for today's lecture. Over the next few lectures, we shall discuss the aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Thank you for your time. Post your questions and give your feedback in comments. Also consider subscribing the channel. Thank you and goodbye.